In this video, we begin our probability review. There are three essential facts, or reasons, for this probability review. First, probability is the language of uncertainty. Risk analysis is all about decision making under uncertainty. So we need some understanding of probability so that we can address the uncertainty that exists in our decision making context. Second, Probability is not intuitive. You can't rely on your gut to work your way through probability kinds of problems. Third, if you're going to be doing some of this risk analysis stuff, someone in your office has to understand probabilities. Everyone in your office who's working with risk analysis is going to have to be comfortable with probability concepts. If for no other reason, then it's an essential part of the definition of risk. Some time ago you saw this simple risk equation. Risk is equal to a consequence times a probability. There is no way to understand risk without understanding probability. Khan Academy, whose URL is here before you on this slide, is an excellent resource for anyone who has been a little bit removed from their probability background. So if these concepts are foreign to you, please make sure you spend some time reviewing some of the videos at the Khan Academy. Let's Make a Deal was a TV game show where contestants in crazy costumes were chosen one at a time to come on down and choose one of the doors. Behind two doors were booby prizes. A, a goat, let's say. Behind the other door was a very nice prize. Let's say a nice new car. So you're going to be a contestant on this show. We have three doors here. What I would like you to do is mentally to choose one of these doors and then to tell me what's the probability that you are going to be right. What's the probability you've chosen the right door? Of course, I'm not sitting with you, so let's suppose that you pick door number two. Now, I'm the game show host, and I know where the grand prize is. I know where the goats are. That is a, an essential piece of information for what follows, because you have picked door number two. Now, knowing that the prize is not behind door number three, I open that and show it to you. And then I ask you if you would like to stay with door two, or would you rather switch to door one? What would you say? I'll give you a moment to think about that. The answer is, you should switch doors it gives you a better chance of winning. Originally, door two had a one-third chance of winning. Doors one and three had a two-third chance of winning. When I showed you that the prize is not behind door three, that two-thirds chance of winning that doors one and three had all of that now transfers to door number one. So door number two still has a one-third chance of winning. Door number one has a two-thirds chance of winning. If you would like the grand prize, you should switch doors. You won't always win, but you'll win twice as often as you would if you stayed with your original door. In Probability is not intuitive. I invite you to use the URL there on your screen where you can go play this game live on the internet. Because probability is not intuitive, we're going to go through a brief review of some probability concepts. We won't be teaching them in this course, so if you've never had them, you may have to spend some extra time with Khan Academy videos and other resources in order to get comfortable with the ideas here.
Since we're reviewing probability, we're not going to go with the most rigorous definitions, but to try to help you develop your informal understanding of these concepts. So we're going to define probability simply as the chance that something will or will not happen. When the probability of rain is 60%, that means there's a 60% chance that it will rain. It also means there's a 40% chance it won't rain. There are two broad views of probability. We'll call the first one historical frequency. This view is based on the idea of counting and observing how often things have occurred in the past and using that information as an estimate of the probability that something will occur again. Historical frequency is a very useful view of probability when you are dealing with things that recur, car accidents that recur, customers that buy your products, floods, any kind of risky thing that you can imagine recurring. Historical frequency is a nice source of information for those. There's another view of probability, the state of belief. This is good for things that don't recur. And here's the difference. Some people believe that a probability is a true, real thing that exists out there in the world and that we can use historical frequencies to try to estimate what that true value is. There are other people who believe that probability is an intrinsic quality. It is intrinsic to the person who is judging a situation. And so in that respect, it's not a universal truth, but it is more of a state of that person's belief about the likelihood of what will occur. So let's take that rain example. Do you believe that under certain conditions there is a universal truth of the likelihood of rain? Is 60%? a universal truth or does that reflect the weather person's state of belief about what will happen given the conditions in the area on that particular day. You are free to use whichever view you like. You're going to have to know a little bit of something about both of them. So in our case studies in the Vibrio Parahemolyticus we talked about the probability that a person who consumes 2,929 pathogenic Vibrio will get sick. In the qualitative risk assessment, we talk about the probability that silver carp will move from the Mississippi River into the Great Lakes. So there are many kinds of probability problems that you'll deal with in, in addressing risks. Here are some simple questions, though. What's the probability that we will have a damaging flood this year in your hometown? What's the probability that steel prices will increase 100% this year? Or that you have a flat tire on your car at least once this year? What's the probability that your stocks are going to lose value over the year? Or that you have an automobile accident or win the lottery this year? If you are a business person, what will be the probability that your store will close this year or that gas will rise above $5 a gallon in the United States? What's the probability that you'll spend more than three days in bed due to an illness or injury? There are so many probability questions that we can pose that are limitless, absolutely limitless. And when we move into the realm of risk, they're absolutely essential. I suppose I kind of like to think of probability as a human construct that helps us understand chance events, which would be natural variability, and uncertainty in general, including knowledge uncertainty. But let's get a little bit more practical now. Probability is going to be measured as a number between 0 and 1. A probability of 0 means an event, an event is impossible. A probability of 1 means the event is certain. Therefore, a probability of 0 0.5 is the most uncertain probability of all. 
sometimes when I ask people the most uncertain probability, they'll give me examples like winning a lottery or some event that has one chance in a hundred million. And my response to that is, that's not uncertain at all. One chance in a hundred million, that's as good as zero. If you have one chance in a hundred million of winning a prize, you're not winning. And I'm going to be right almost all the time. So 0.5 is the most uncertain probability of all. At the top of the slide, we have the 36 different outcomes that can occur when you throw a pair of dice. We're not going to do a whole lot with cards and dice and those sorts of things because our risk problems rarely involve cards or dice. But here's an important point. Of all the identified possible outcomes, something has to occur, or we haven't identified all the possible outcomes. So something has to happen. And the sum of the probabilities of all of our possibilities for a given situation or decision problem, the sum of all those probabilities has to equal 1. So when we say a probability is a number between 0 and 1, and 1 is certainty, if we have identified all of the possible outcomes, then we know with certainty that one of those outcomes has to occur. Therefore, the total probability of all of those outcomes is equal to 1. Here's a simple example that hopefully will illustrate that idea that all of our possibilities has to sum to one. This is a very um, simplistic earthquake model. An earthquake occurs and then the soil liquefies yes or the soil liquefies no. There are two possible outcomes. Yes, the soil liquefies, no it doesn't. On the line the yes line is the probability of yes, 30%. On the no line is the probability of no, 70%. You'll notice that because it has to be either yes or no, the sum of those possibilities has to equal 100. Let's look at the yes line where the soil has liquefied. Then we'd like to know, does the concrete monolith that we're interested in crack? Yes or no? Once again, the yes and no are the only two possibilities and so their probability has to equal 100. Let's jump down to the situation where the soil does not liquefy. Once again we have cracking yes or cracking no and that probability sum has to equal 100 also. This little model gives us four endpoints, the four blue triangles that you're looking at. They are the four outcomes. The first triangle would be the soil liquefies and the monolith cracks. The second is the soil liquefies, the monolith does not crack, and so on. Take a look at the blue probabilities. There are four possible outcomes, four possibility. Add up those four blue probabilities, and once again, you'll see the probability is 100%, or 1 one of those things has to happen. So even these simple rules that we begin with now become very important because you will be building event tree models like this and it's essential that the probabilities be correct or your model will give you wrong results. This probability is indeed a number between 0 and 1 and we have several options for how we choose to express probabilities. We could use a decimal, a 0.6 chance of rain, a percentage, 60% chance of rain, a fraction, 3 fifths chance of rain, or odds. The odds are 3 to 2 that it rains. Which of these do you think would be the most commonly used form of expressing probabilities? I suppose the answer really depends on the audience that we're talking about. In the United States, odds are probably most common simply because of people who bet on sports events, horse racing, and those sorts of things. 
There are people there who know odds extremely well and might not be able to handle the other forms of probability. As it turns out, if we're talking about uh, probabilities of individual events, like the probability that a person gets sick from Vibrio parahemolyticus in oysters, there's a good chance that we would be using decimal values because those values tend to be small. On the other hand, when we were talking about risks to entire populations, we often use the percentage. Which one you use will be entirely up to you once you get out of this, this class and these programs. But as we move through in class exercises, please be aware of the form that we are using to express our probabilities. How do we get these probabilities? Where do they come from? Here you see identified three sources. We have classical probabilities, sometimes called analytical probabilities. So some of the probabilities that we deal with are analytically derived. Other probabilities are empirical or frequentist probabilities. And then there are subjective probabilities. We're going to take a look at each in turn. Analytical probabilities can be calculated. They're calculated on the basis of treating equally likely events as all having the same probability, 1 over n, where n is the number of possible outcomes. So these kinds of probabilities only apply to a narrow set of situations. But one such situation would be throwing a single die. A die has six sides. Each one is equally likely. So the chance of rolling a one with a single die is one over six. Tossing a coin is another example. There are two equally likely outcomes and the chance of getting a head is equal to one half. So if you happen to have an experiment or an event that has equally likely outcomes, using that fact and the combinatorics that you may have learned somewhere in the past in your education, you can derive analytical probabilities. The combinatorics are factorial rule of counting, permutations, and combinations, and those sorts of things. Let's take a simpler example, though to illustrate an analytical probability. If we roll two die, there are 36 different outcomes, each being equally likely. So any outcome has a 1 36th chance of occurring. I'd like to know what the probability of rolling a 7 would be. If you look at the table, beginning in the lower left, and moving on the diagonal up toward the upper right, you will see that there are six different ways of obtaining a 7. Each of these ways has one chance in 36. 6 times 1 36th equals 1 6th. So the probability of rolling a 7 with two fair die is 1 out of 6. Calculating probabilities like this doesn't come up that often in our risk assessments. Usually we're dealing with situations that are far more complex and we don't often have the luxury of a collection of equally likely events. Empirical probabilities are another source of probability estimates. And empirical probabilities are far more useful to risk assessors. They're usually based on observation. How many times did the event of interest happen out of the number of times it could have happened? Let's take the red light near your house. Think of any red light near your house that's on your regular commute. Sometimes you catch it red, sometimes you catch it green. What's the probability that you're going to catch that light red? Well, you may or may not know that number or be able to uh, hazard a guess at it. But it would be very easy to come up with an estimate of that probability. It might take a little time. But if you've got a paper and a pencil and set it on the seat of your car, and every time you go through the light, you make a strike mark. And in a separate column, 
you keep track of the number of times it was read when you got there and pretty soon you would have a probability estimate. If it was read 19 out of 50 times then we would have a rough estimate that there's a 38 percent chance that you're going to catch that light red on any given trip. This kind of probability is very useful when the process that we're interested in is repeated many times under the same circumstances. If we're concerned about how often people get sick by consuming uh, oysters with a certain number of Vibrio, that could be estimated by observation. Uh, we could estimate the probability of a flood by counting the number of years in the record and the number of years in the record that had floods of a certain magnitude and so on. People generally regard this relative frequency as an approximation of the true probability of an event. That makes empirical probabilities very useful for risk assessors. Let's take a simple example from my experience realm. Uh, this is a Google Earth view of Sunbury, Pennsylvania. You see the town on the right and then there is a ribbon of a river, the Susquehanna River, before you see land on the other side of the river. Suppose we would like to know the probability that the flow, the amount of water in the river moving past Sunbury is greater than 200,000 cubic feet per second. The river is quite large there. So I went to a database that had flows for 27,020 days. So this flow greater than 200,000 could have occurred 27,020 times. As it turned out, it only occurred 138 times. So you see here three different ways that we could express this probability that the flow would exceed 200,000 CFS at Sunbury on any given day. When you are fortunate enough to have the data, empirical probabilities are a great thing. There are some events that don't lend themselves to analytical probabilities or to the observation of empirical probabilities. When those kinds of events are encountered, subjective probability comes in very handy. Subjective probabilities are based on the available evidence and the experience of the person who is uh, estimating the probability. It's just that the evidence wouldn't be uh, the observation of frequencies with which something would occur. There would be other kinds of evidence that would be used. And so usually subjective probability relies on expert opinion. Later in this course, we'll take a look at expert elicitation in a little bit more detail, and that's a technique that's used to try to elicit the degree of belief that experts have that a thing will or will not happen. Subjective probability is most useful when we deal with uncertain events that will occur only once, in other words, events that don't recur, or events that have not yet occurred. For example, I um, mentioned in an earlier video that I was working on a study to widen the Houston Ship Channel. We were concerned with the probability that vessels moving in the channel would have an accident. Accidents on the water are called casualties. So we were interested in the probability of different casualties. If that channel was made 200 feet wider, the probability of all the casualties would be reduced because there would be a greater margin of safety for maneuvering in the channel. But there would be no way to use empirical data for that because such a channel has never occurred. It has never existed. So the only way to estimate those probabilities would be use available evidence, perhaps on other channels of that width, or extrapolating from the data that you have with the existing width of the channels and getting experienced people to do so Coast Guard accident investigators or the the pilots who bring vessels up and down those channels 
they're the folks that we would have estimating these probabilities. These are a few things you need to know to work with probabilities. If it was that simple, anyone could do it. It is not that simple. There are rules and theories that govern our use of probabilities. In estimating the probabilities of real situations that we encounter in risk assessments requires us to think about some complex events. Most of us don't naturally assess probabilities well, so in the next video we're going to review a few of these rules and theories.